morning and uh, see what the Lord has for us. I know he has something new because we have bulletins on the back table for the first time in a while, but they're there. So if you want to get a bulletin, go ahead and get it. I'm just going to open with prayer now and then uh, I'll give some announcements at the music so okay? Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we do ask that you uh, meet with us today, guide and direct and bless us, that you anoint the word, the worship and music, and any testimony that might be received and have it uh, applied to our hearts and our lives and make us more like you. And we'll give you the praise and the glory as you do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, church. Morning. Good morning. Um, Rigo is at uh, Natchez uh, Nazarene today with the Gideons. And so Jane and I will, will lead us this morning. Um, our first hymn today is going to be number 337 in the hymnal, Softly and Tenderly. Thank you. 
Our responsive reading today will be in three, excuse me, three sixteen in your hymnal. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because in Christ, Christ, Christ Jesus, Jesus, the law of the Spirit, Spirit of life, life set you free, free from, from the law of sin and death. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit, Spirit desires. desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. In Christ, sorry, if Christ is in you, your spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, He will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who lives in you. If by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Amen. Our final hymn today will be in 626, Gentle Shepherd. 626.
thank you for bringing us to your house today. Teach us what you have us have for us today, Lord, as we seek your face. And we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The children are dismissed. request this morning to uh, read the Lord's Prayer. It's also in our hymnal, but I think we probably have to practice it or something. But we'll just, I'll read it. And it's in Matthew, of course, chapter 6, verse 9. I'm always amazed sometimes at how short some things are. Um, probably the American speech is the shortest of all, but maybe the most remembered is the Gettysburg Address. I don't think it's about 300 words, 260 or something like that, Don. Um, and yet it's probably the most remembered of all speeches. And uh, this is certainly going to be the most remembered prayer. And Christian I don't know, you know, other places even have prayers, but this is this is certainly a Christian dumb. So Matthew 6, 9 says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is, as it is in heaven, Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then we, he asks, For if you forgive men when they are against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Lord Jesus, thank you for this prayer and for the request for it. We uh, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, it's been a while since we've had bulletins, but we have them again. I guess Marvin and Kathy, I don't know, one of you, Marvin probably did it this time, but Kathy does them often when uh, Marvin's gone. And so that's one more thing. We decided to cancel, we get a box of uh, these every month, you know, and for, or every quarter, I guess it is, for, for the quarter. Anyway, it's, it's, we can continuously. We've got enough for about three years now, so. We canceled our orders. <laughs> We've got plenty of them. They're not dated until you put a date on them, right? I mean, they're seasonal, but they're not necessarily dated. Uh, prayer closet, it says Pastor Angus and Maxine, Pastor Don, Kathy, and family. Missions, the Dominican Republic Orphanage, and the Curves. Uh, the missionaries are, there's a church board meeting coming up on June 14th at 7 p.m. Evening worship this weekend. Mimsy, are you still? Yeah. Ins is going to be doing our message this evening. Uh, I encourage you to attend if you can, and that will be at 6 o'clock. Uh, I think that's about it. Any other announcements? Birthdays or anniversaries? The kids already left. Oh, well, they can sing birthday to them. We'll have to do it again next week, but that's all right. Any birthdays or anniversaries? Well, yesterday, the church sponsored, wasn't the only sponsor, Dick Sporting Goods a sponsor. Uh, I don't know if I'm even saying the name right, but it's that engineering firm, Fabrizi or whatever. Uh, they're kind of a sponsor. There are several sponsors. PLSA, they're, they're, they're several sponsors. And I don't know if you know what it was like yesterday morning. Oh, actually noon when it started. It rained. And it kind of rained like a sleep, almost almost a hail, Steve, getting kind of there. And the wind blew and it was uh, it was something else. So we kind of scattered. And then came back, and because the weather got better later, and 
dried out, and then they watch the Sandlot again. That the movie. That's what they do every year at the Little Lake Park. There, they watch the Sandlot. And that was. Uh, I know you guys were there. Uh, quite a few of the people from the church were there, and uh, others came as well. I saw one grandmother with a with a little one, and the little one was getting in the water right when it was raining and sleeting, and. I had two grandkids there, their lips were blue and they were chitter chattering. I'd take them home to dry them out, kind of, you know, and uh, come back. But it was nicer when we came back and it was okay. But uh, I'm glad we didn't cancel because the weather changed back to a, a good time. So that's kind of an outreach of the church. We've spent quite a bit of money on that. Uh, it's money that we have been gifted uh, with, but uh, Krista and uh, Regal's done a lot of that work, and they work at the concession stand also, and uh, Jacob's coaching. I know that you've been doing some coaching too, Avery. Have you been there? Yeah, uh, with the kids. And so it's been kind of a good outreach. And I, you know, at the time you start thinking, I don't know if I want to do this, whatever this is. Uh, you're creating memories in children's lives that they will have, I know it's true, Ray, because I'm going to be 73 this summer, and I can still remember the two home runs I hit when I was 11 years old, and I can tell you exactly where they went. One went about six foot high, really impressive, he didn't impress me, six foot high, over, the, down the third base line and, and cleared the center field fence. The other, I did what my dad was always telling me not to do. He hated it when I swung like this. He wanted me to short my swing, choke up on the bat, I thought, no, I ain't choking up. I'm going to get that bat halfway in my, I, I want to get as much leverage as I can get. And I happened to do all those swings, Don, golf swing, and caught the ball right in the, right the fat of the bat. You've got that really satisfying thump that doesn't hurt your hands. You know what I mean if you hit baseballs. And it just climbed and climbed and climbed. Of course, I was only 11. My memory is probably not that good anymore. It climbed and climbed and climbed and cleared the center field fence. Right dead center. I'll never forget it. Well, maybe I will. I haven't yet. So, what they're doing, I bet you they'll remember their hits. Or the time they threw somebody else. Because it's a memorable thing. Sometimes at 11 years old, you throw somebody out gone. But a lot of times, if I was a coach, I'd just say, keep running. Just keep running, because a lot of times they'll get a single or a bunt and it ends up being a home, you know, it ends up being a home run. But it's a wonderful thing to watch, and it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. And thank you all for doing it. Your church is a part of it. So today we're going to look at Joshua uh, chapter one, verses three and four. This is been, this this sermon has been after me for two weeks. So Joshua chapter one, verses three and four. God says, I will give you. He's telling Joshua, he's taking most of this place now. He says, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert in Lebanon and from the great river the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. That's a lot of country. That's a lot of country. That was promised to Joshua, to the people of God. It's a lot of, it's a lot of territory. We're going to discuss what territory that was and how much it was because it has something to do with where we are today. And there's 45 verses in the Bible that say, go up and possess the land. So I didn't want to put them all in there because we'd be doing 45 verses, go up and possess the land. This is the one he's given to the person most immediately going to do it, Joshua. He says, go up. Your territory will extend from the desert. 
Now, I don't know if he's talking about what desert he's talking about, particularly. The great desert is Saudi Arabia. The Negev, the portion down in the Gaza Strip or below. But I do know where Lebanon is. It's still there. We do know where the Euphrates is. And we do know where the Hittite country is. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, take the scripture, apply it to our hearts and lives today. Help us to see that it's not dead history, it's prophecy made for our time, this day, this people. And yeah, we'll give you the praise as you do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do not, brothers and sisters, fall short again. They fell short. Do not fall short again. Israel today is 8,019 square miles. Yakima County is 4,035. Israel's the size of Yakima County. You got to take you can take two other counties. Okanagan County is just a little too much in Yakima County. Together, a little bigger. But if you take uh, Yakima, Benton, and Franklin, the Tri Cities, you, you pretty much get the size of Israel. At its farthest, it's 283 miles. That sounds well, it's got to be pretty good size, yeah. It wouldn't be if it was wide, but it's only 17 miles wide in some places, Marvin. And it is widest, it's 90 miles wide. So it's, yes, it's a sliver this way, north and south, but it's fairly thin east and west. But the land of the promise was at least a million square miles. At least. And maybe much more. Maybe much more. Do you know where the Euphrates River is? It starts in Turkey, Anatolia. You know where it ends? It goes down, it's a border that is about two thirds to three quarters of the way over into Iraq. This leaves a sliver of Iraq between Iraq and Iran, and it ends at Kuwait City. So the promise, at least, at least, was for all of Jordan, all of Israel and Judah, all of Jordan, all of Lebanon, all of Kuwait. Yeah, it's west of the Euphrates. All of Kuwait. Three quarters of Iraq. Look it up. Three quarters of Iraq. Most of Syria. And if you look at the Hittite Empire, you know what the Hittite Empire was? What country comprised most of the Hittite Empire? It's one of the largest militaries in the world, one of the strongest countries in the world. Turkey. The Hittite country was Turkey. Four-fifths of Turkey. That's what God promised them in this scripture. At least one million square miles. At least the size of all western states. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and Colorado. And maybe as big as Turkey more. Oh, and the Hittites were preceded by the Assyrians, or the other way around. The Assyrians were mostly Hittite, and their empire stretched to Iran. All the Hittites of the hill country. I don't know what that means. I do know, at the very least, it means one million square miles, an area as big as all the western states. And they ended up taking Yakima County, Benton County, and Franklin. Do not 
fall short again. That's the message for the church. Do not fall short again. Do not trade your, your birthright for a bowl of porridge. That's what it's saying. Like Esau, I did it. He bitterly resented it, and though he cried, it didn't do him any good. Do not. There is a disastrous cost to only accepting part of the promise. There was a disastrous cost for them. Disastrous. Oh, did I tell you that part of that area, if you draw a line from Gaza to the mouth of the Euphrates, the delta, the Euphrates delta, that includes a lot of Saudi Arabia too. You know an empire that big would have been hard for Rome to conquer? You know an empire that big with a natural barrier of 500,000 square miles of sand that nobody invaded because nobody wanted it would have been a barrier to Islam to escape the Saudi Arabian Peninsula? It was slapping silly. When they had to have the fights in Europe, Israel would have slapped them silly if they had stepped in to the promise instead of just a small, exceedingly small part of the promise. Why? There is a disastrous cost to only accepting part of the promise. Oh, later on they were invaded by the Assyrians, weren't they? They were captured and carried into captivity. They were invaded by a country that should have been their country. They were invaded by the Babylonians too, weren't they? Which country God gave them? They didn't take it. So they decided, these countries decided to take them. Over and over and over have they been invaded by the people they were supposed to supplant. They were promised to supplant. Over and over. 1948, the only people that supported Israel was the Skoda Works, a Czechoslovakian arms manufacturer. We did it. England did it. Nobody did. Even after the Holocaust, nobody supported them. And they fought their independence. Three million ragtag refugees from the Holocaust against 140 million Arabs, and they won. No thanks to us. Later on, we joined. Three times they slapped silly that same invading force when they tried to attack Israel. The Jordan, Egyptian, and Syrian air force was destroyed before they got off the runway. There weren't even an air force that rounded before they got into the air by the Israelis. Well, it's not fair. They give a surprise attack. Well, you put in your constitution that your stated goal is the destruction of the Zionist state, and you're going to drive them all into the Mediterranean and kill them every one. Why wouldn't they believe you? The problem is they didn't believe you. And they preemptively struck. The, Iraqi, the, the Iraqis spent years building nuclear reactor, reactors at Osiric. Had $5 billion. The $5 billion was, was some money. 1980. The Israelis let them finish it almost, Steve. And then they flew. Netanyahu's brother flew about 100 yards off the, off the ground. And they blew it up. I got news for you today. The Iranians better hope that they don't get a nuclear weapon. Because the Israelis aren't going to go into the ovens again. They're not. They've been that route. They're not going to depend on the West to save them. They've been that route. You don't want them to believe. And if you are an enemy of Israel, you really don't want them to believe you're going to destroy them. Because they will strike. And we can't keep that lap dog, because it's not our lap dog. We can't, that's, we can't keep that lap dog. I, I see this as really popular on Facebook, really. We can't keep that lap, lap dog in control. But originally, the people messed up because God says, go up and pick this land, wherever your feet go. And this is where your feet should be going. All the Hittite country. That'd be almost all of Turkey today. All of Syria, 
all of Jordan, all of Kuwait, everything to the Euphrates River, all of northern Saudi Arabia. And you know the Hittite, the Assyrian Empire actually extended to Thebes, several hundred miles south of Cairo in Egypt. How much did God really do? I'm not going to argue the boundaries, because if you, if you take it back to the smallest boundaries imaginable, it's still a million square miles bigger than all the western states in the United States. An area that big, and they settled for an area the size of Yakima County, Tibet and Franklin County. They were told there's a vast cost to not accepting the promise. We're talking about historically, there's a vast cost to that, but countless wars from then to now trying to reclaim or to hold on to that 8,019 when a vastly bigger amount was yours. To try to hold on. Second, the total, the vast cost was multiplied by their partial acceptance. Even what they accepted, they didn't accept very well. What did God tell them to do? He told them to dispossess the Canaanites. That sounds really harsh. It does. It sounds really harsh. This possessed the Canaanites. Who not entertain peaceful coexistence with them? You know, the Spirit it says God will not always contend with people. We take that to mean like at the end, there's going to come an end time, but there might be a time in your life where God decides, or my life, where God decides I'm not contending with him anymore. God had come to that, to that view of the Canaanites. I'm not contending with them anymore. They are burning their babies alive on the altar of Moloch so they can have a higher wheat yield, more eggs, more butter, more cream. I'm not contending with them anymore. I'm done with them. What did they do? They intermarried with them. They adopted their gods. They worship their gods. We don't believe it, read the Old Testament. Time after time after time after time they turn to those gods. Time after time after time. They were to remove them. They married them and chose their gods as their own. You see, we have to make room though in every story for restoration. But there was always room for Romans 8.28. God always leaves room for miracles. But, well, they really messed up. Yes, they really messed up. Did that mean God abandoned them? That God gave them no way back? That God didn't help them? No. Because we say in Romans 8.28 that we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I mean, I just point to Rahab and Ruth. Rahab and Ruth were both Canaanites, weren't they? Rahab been despised, didn't she? Ruth chose to serve Jehovah. And they were both in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Read the first chapter of Matthew. Ruth was a Moabite, a Canaanite. Rahab was too. Because you people throw God away doesn't mean that God cannot be approached by a contrite heart. David says, a contrite heart you will not refuse. You see, they only accepted a small part of the promise. This is all these thousands of years ago. And the part they did accept, they did not honor the real terms of acceptance. And God said, this is, this is, what I want you to do. They didn't you know. They, they said, we will take this much and we'll do this. And God still redeemed it. God is still redeeming. God is still there, involved in their protection. God still redeemed those people. Or offered them redemption. What about us today, though? 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture... All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, 
correcting and training in righteousness. Does that include this scripture? All scripture. All scripture. Is it for us? It says all scripture is God read. It's, it's useful. It's for us. Scripture isn't for the people that are back there. They're gone. Their day has come and gone. Whatever their choices were or weren't, and the ending ending point of their life with God, uh, that's story is over. The scripture is there for us. I don't want to go too far sideways, but what do you think when you read when you read the story about the guy who owed, I don't know, like millions of dollars, and he couldn't pay it, and he he threw himself on the mercy of this guy, don't throw me in jail, and my children, and my wife, and make them all work as slaves, and, and you know, I can, he says, I know you can't pay me back, I forgive you. And he leaves and he goes down the steps and he grabs somebody else him ten bucks. Ten something. Ten bucks. He, he throttles him. You will pay every stinking cent you owe me. And I'll throw your kids in prison and your wife in prison. And you know why that's there? Because God knows that we're going to see ourselves almost certainly as the person who forgave. And we're not going to see ourselves as the person to hold it held somebody's feet to the fire at some point in our life. Scripture is a mirror. It wants you to see. You know, it wants you to examine. Is there any way in me that's like that? And if there is, help me to not be like that. I have received freely. Let me give freely. Scripture is a mirror. What's this mirror tell us? He said, come on up all the time and occupy the land, occupy the promise. Your sons and daughters will have vision. Come on up. Occupy the promise. Occupy the land. It's a land that's vast beyond measure. Wherever your feet step, claim it for the Lord. You're an ambassador of Christ. You're like an emissary of the king, the Spanish conquistadores and the English. And they planted a flag and they said, I plant this for is Ferdinand Isabella or for Queen Elizabeth. They claimed it for the crown. He says, you need to claim, go up and claim the land for God. The land in your life. It might not be physical land. It might be people and their souls. It might be your family. You need to occupy that land. And Isaiah 30, 21 says, yeah, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it or follow it whether it turns to the right or to the left, then you will dishonor. What he's saying when you dishonor, you will throw away your idols, your silver-plated idols and your gold-covered statues. You will throw them away like clothing ruined by stains. You will say to them, get out. You will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, follow it. How are you going to hear a voice saying where your foot should walk? Well, Caleb and Joshua... They were ready to do whatever God wanted, to walk wherever God wanted to walk. They just happened to be leading a group of people who didn't want to do anything. That was scary. Anything that looked like it might cost them something, and they settled for an exceedingly small inheritance when a vast inheritance was theirs for the taking. I think that's where the church is today. I very seldom mention a church by name, so maybe I shouldn't. It happens to be a, one of the Lutheran denominations. So I won't mention it. Right. So there's a lot of Lutheran denominations. Said this week that abortion should be not only legal, it should be readily accessible. Well, we're to the point now where in the United States of America, people are squibbling about a law because it wasn't adopted. And the law said that if you're a physician, you have to perform abortion. If, you're a, if, I, if I'm a surgeon, uh, is the government supposed to tell me that I have to operate on legs or arms or hearts? Don't surgeons get to choose what, what, who they operate on and what they operate on by, spe by specialty? The doctors by type? But if you're a doctor, you have to do this. Not only do you have to do this, that if for some reason the baby survives trying to suck its brain out and lives, you have to withhold 
aid and let it die. Up to a week. That was the law. Read it. Don't, well, don't listen to nobody, myself included, that tells you what a law is saying. Go read it. It should have been thrown out. The wonder is it was only thrown out 41, 51 to 49. It should have been 100 to 0. There's no country on the planet, none, that allows babies to be aborted after they're born. There's only two that allow them to be aborted up to the ninth month. No European country does. Canada, they, they're all 16 weeks or less, or 20 at the most. But here, nine months, and if they happen to survive, you let them die. You have to let them die. You don't give them any water, you don't give them nothing. I'm glad it was voted down. I don't care if it makes me popular or not. It's murder. And it's time it's called murder. And God told the Canaanites, what you're doing, you're killing your kids after they're born. Amen. Margaret Sanger was a villarant racist. I'm going sideways now. Amen. A villarant racist. Right. Thought she was superior to everybody else. A white upper middle class or uh, higher than that woman. And everybody else was undesirable, particularly minorities. And anybody she considered feeble-minded, intellectually challenged, disabled, you name it. Irish, black, brown. She wanted to kill them after they were born. Her whole group, read it. She's the, she's the mother of Planned Parenthood. Read it. Don't take my word for it. Margaret Sanger, S-A-N-G-E-R, the mother of Planned Parenthood. They do everything they can do to hide that mother. There's something wrong when we're to the point where we say it's all right to kill a baby after it's born. I got people in my family that were born that are alive that were born in six months and eight months. Don't tell me somebody in six months or eight months is not alive. Tell me, I don't care. I won't believe you. I've seen two of them in my own family that are alive. She realized, this is the devil, folks. She realized we'll, not, we'll never be able to convince the people in this country to kill their babies out. So that's why the vote was against that bill. To kill the babies after they're alive. So we have to kill them before they're born. And where do you think almost all the abortion clinics are in this country that do the most business? In the communities of people she hated thought deserved to die and be eliminated. The barrios and the ghettos. Look it up. And they sell those collagens and those baby parts so that rich women can have smoother skin. And you think God's going to contend with us forever? Do you really? There's a time when God's spirit will say enough is enough. People right now are astounded that the supply chains are falling apart and the world economies are falling apart. Read a guy, one six, he says, you put work to put your money in your pocket that has a hole in it, you walk home and your money falls out. And he says, you want to know why? It's not your brother. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. It's me. I'm tired of you having my house be, every man have his own house fixed in my house in ruins. I'm the one that's doing it. And if when the prophet, the apostle, John, was talking about, in Revelations, about crying and weeping because there was no one to open the seal. And the seal was opened by someone who looked as if it was a lamb slain since the foundations of the world by Christ. And he says, no one, no man will close this seal. I had a conversation with a guy in front of a nurse. Now I stepped out. I wasn't going to say anything because I thought maybe he's crazy and, he, and maybe I'm crazy. And we would have a strange conversation. But we started talking and an hour later we're still talking. We come to the conclusion that 
the ingredients for the end time are here. It's like ingredients for a cake or probably in your closet. It doesn't mean the cake's going to get cooked today. It might not be cooked in your lifetime. It might be cooked 500 years from now. What it means is the ingredients are here. We talk about the mark of the beast. You don't think they can look at your eyes and see who you are? You say, well, people will never, ever give up their freedom to a worldwide government. Just manufacture another disease. You don't have to have a real one this time. Just, just the fear of one. And see how many people will give up their independence for being taken care of. Well, I don't know any of that stuff, so I ain't going there. I just know that no man knows the time, but I know that the ingredients are here. And, now, and I do know that God is probably sick to his stomach at what we do and we call holy. If you were sick of the Canaanites, how far do we have to go before we reach their sacrifice and the one and two year olds? Well, that'll never happen here. I don't know. Maybe not. So the giants, but giants, that's what they said when he, you know, back there, he said, and you said too, and I said, but giants, there's giants. The cost is too high. How can I serve God? The cost is too high. That's an inappropriate response. I shouldn't even tell a joke now, but I will. Since why we blame Adam for, for the way things are or, or, or whatever, and God was talking to Adam about making him a helpmate, and he says, uh, what will she do? She says, she'll worship the ground you walk on. She'll attend to your every need. She'll laugh at all your jokes. She'll listen to your harebrained scheme. She'll think everything. She'll, just, she'll worship the ground you walk on. He says, how much is this going to cost me? He's a typical guy. How much is this going to cost me? God says, an arm and a leg. He says, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> well, he's playing Eve. It was Adam, I'm telling you, folks. God says, I want all of you. Not an arm and a leg. I want all of you. From the crown of your head to the bottom of your feet. I want all of you. There is no plan B about that statement. It costs too much. As if there's a plan B. Would you tell me what the plan B is? By the time you get to your death, your last breath, you will have spent your last breath. All your money will be gone. All the baskets I collected will be at my kids' yard sales. Or they'll keep them for a memory of me. But they'll, it'll all be gone for me. You're 100% invested in this life. And when you're gone, you, you leave 100% of yourself here. I mean, your last breath, your last effort. There's, it's not like you're, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to pay 70%. No, everybody pays 100%. So the question is, that that's, Satan's always bringing up questions that sound reasonable. Well, it costs too much. What is the option? And if Satan was honest, which well, he isn't because he's a liar, the father of lies, he'd have to tell you, everything's going to cost you. Anything you do is going to cost you. Everything. Your choice is what do you spend your life on. What do you give your life to? As a father, you could just say, I'm out the door, I'm going, I'm, I'll see you later. And, or you can invest your life in your children and your wife. What do you, you don't have, there is no, you, you, you see what I'm saying? You have to do that. And you come up with arguments, and I do too, that sound sensible. What I share a lot is a woman that said uh, she helped her husband get through school, be a doctor. She saw, she was in the doctoral study, of course. She, she helped him get to be a doctor. She was a nurse. And he left her for a nurse. She said, I'm 45 or whatever I am. If I go back and finish my doctor, get my doctor's license, I'll be 49. He says, dear Abby, he said, how old are you going to be in four years if you don't go back to school? See, we, we bring up things that sound really sensible. The truth is, there are reasons not to go to school, but not getting older isn't one of them. Because you're going to get older. And so, you might as well get older and do what it is that God calls you to do. Because 
You're going to be fully invested in this life. It's just what you're going to invest in. So I was looking at uh, 1 Samuel 24, 24, because this is a history. I, I throw a lot of history out there today, so I, maybe I shouldn't. But, you know, I kind of like history. That's probably why I shouldn't do it. But anyway, uh, 1 Samuel 24, 24 is a verse that talks about uh, David get the threshing floor for paranoia to stop a play, basically, to offer a sacrifice to stop a play. And I've known this story for a long time, and he offered it uh, to him free. And David says, I will not. I will not, ex I will not make a sacrifice that doesn't cost me something. See, God wants sacrificial giving on our part. He wants us to be invested, to have some skin in the game. He wants it to be part of what we give ourselves to. Not just something that somebody hands you. And so this is what he says. I was reading some, uh, you know, there's commentaries. Like we have commentaries and I got several, 30 volume or more, Beacons and Clarks. I got several commentaries out there. People that spent their life going from the first verse in the Bible to the last, telling you what it means, the historical, how much an ape is, it's about a bushel, and how much, you know, so on and so forth. How much this was, because we don't know their money terms or their measurements, but it tells you what they are. King David purchased the threshing floor of Aranoa, the Jebusite, and according to classic rabbinic opinion, which is their commentaries, the entire city of and they're, they're using the old spelling, so I've got it, but I know it's Jerusalem. It's got a Y-E-R, uh, R-E-R-U-S-H-A-L-A-Y-I-M. I'm going to say Jerusalem, okay? That flesh, threshing floor, the place where he ex intends to offer sacrifices, is now called the Har Habayit, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. As this site would later become the location of the Beit Hamikdash, the Temple. Did you know that? I didn't know that. That became the temple. David purchases, purchases the land publicly, just as Abraham did when he purchased the cave of Machpelah in Chevron for a great sum of money and in front of witnesses, Genesis 23. Although, like Abraham, David was offered the site as a gift. He does not want any future generations to claim that it was stolen by, Margaret probably knows his name more than I do, Bene, and Israel is spelled with a Y-I-S-R-A-E-L, Bene Israel, the children of Israel. Since the sale of each is recorded in the Bible, the sages of the Midrash, the homiletic teachings, the commentaries of the, the Hebrews on the scripture, teach that Jerusalem, Shebron, and Shechem, which was similarly purchased by Jacob, or Jacob, see Genesis 33, 19, are the three places that indisputably belong to the Jewish people. This is the oldest title search in history, folks. This is older Yakima Federal. Or whoever we have for a title, this is the oldest title, and it's in the Bible. It's recorded publicly. Deeded and recorded, the threshing floor became the temple. And God says he's going to thresh the wheat and the tares. The threshing floor became the temple. Why settle? Why settle for less when more is available? Why would they have settled for 8,000 square miles, an area the size of New Jersey, when they could have had an area that was at least as big as the entire western United States, and maybe as big as the entire western United States, and Alaska, and Texas, and Oklahoma thrown in. Huge. Two-thirds of the size of the United States was given to them as a promise and end up taking 8,019 square miles. First Corinthians 2.9 says, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Hold the thought for those who love him. Go on up and claim the land. You and I, go on up and claim the land. 
Stop counting the cost. Stop worrying about the cost. God says, I want you to step into the promise. And as you step into the promise, he'll make provision for us. He'll fashion the weapon, he says, that nothing can stand against. He will outfit us, just like he did David with a slingshot, just like he did the boy with fishes and loaves. He will outfit us with common items that are readily available, and he will make them extraordinary for the mission. Go on up and claim the land. God is not going to offer you something that isn't going to cost you something. Because it doesn't work that way. He says that we're to be like him. Who is him? Jesus. It's enough for the student to be like the teacher. It's enough. We are to be like him. John 12, 14, he says, After I leave, you will do greater gifts than these. You. Jesus said that. It is my food, John 4, 34, is to do the work of him who sent me. 1 John 3, 8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared. Not the reasons. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the work of the devil. And you and I are to be part of that work. We've been chosen to be part of that work. He says in the, Old, in the end of the Old Testament, the minor prophets choose this day blessing or a curse. He says in Malachi, test me, put me to the test and see if I will not overflow an abundant blessing to you. A guy I referenced earlier. So if you want to have a blessing in your life, you need to move into the promise. The blessings in the promise. The terms that God has set for us. <clears throat> and we read in Romans 8, 28, because that's where I end up today. There's a redemptive part for that for us. You and I haven't always believed in the promise. I didn't even know there was a God for a while. Miserable, horrible, despondent, despair. To not know there's a God. To be so blinded that you do not know. I mean, I wasn't rejecting him. I didn't know he was there. And then he was. Well, he was there. Then I knew he was there. And everything changed. Everything changed. Because if there is a God, he is what? Worthy to receive our worship as in Worthy is the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Amen. He is worthy of receiving our homage, our best, of our investing our hopes in Him. I invested my hopes in all kinds of things. None of them satisfied. None of them. For a season, possibly, that wore thin after a while. None of them satisfied. If you were very thirsty right now, would you just gorge yourself on a salty snack? Probably not, because you want to slake your thirst. Water or liquids for thirst. Food. You would not eat a lot of food if you were dying of thirst. You would not eat a lot, you want to drink a lot of water if you were starving for food. Food has a purpose. Water has a purpose. Our liquids have a purpose. God's spirit feeds your spirit, your food, and my food is to do the will of the Father. To try to take anything else and make it satisfy that will not work. I'm not, God's not doing that to be mean to you or to me. He just said, go ahead. And sometimes he'll say, go ahead. Go ahead and chase that. Go ahead and chase that. Because he knows, doesn't he, that it isn't going to work. And sometimes it's when things don't work in our lives, it wasn't mine, and when things still don't work in my life, I have to come back to God. And I have to believe that he's telling the truth when he says, step on up. Possess the land. This last week I had that conversation with this guy. I've been having people come across my path lately, Don. My grandson, one of my grandsons, grown one, stopped me, talked for an hour, said, I want to know 
I don't have any peace. I'm not naming them, but it's I, I don't have any peace. I want what you have. I want to know who you know. We talked about an hour ago. Did he accept God Christ yet? No. But he hasn't said anything before, right? I want to know. Folks, there's people all around us that know they're not being satisfied. They know they're, they're thirsty. They're hungry for something. Real food. He says, real food. He says, living water. Real water. They're hungry and thirsty for God. And that's the thing that we really do not have to be afraid of what's going on in this world. It's been going on for a long time. Wars, famines, pestilence, apostasy. It's been going on a long time. What we need and what we have an opportunity to do as children of God is to claim our family. Our friend, those who God sends across our path. That's the ground God wants claimed. It's not a physical boundary anymore. It's to claim those who still do not know the Lord. And to take every opportunity to speak the words of God into their hearts and their lives. Or to pray that if it's not you, that someone else would be the person who does that in their lives. She says, go on up. Yes, go on up. Is it scary? Well, yeah, I think it's always going to be scary. It's going to cost you something. Nothing else, just getting out of your comfort zone. It might cost you a whole lot more than that. But go up anyway. Go up. Claim your children. Face the giants. They're not going away. Face the giants. Learn to have a word on your lips and your heart. You don't have to speak it out loud. You don't want to fight people physically, really. But say, who may be, who are you to defy the armies of the living God? You're part of the army of the living God. Who are you? Who are you to defy God? We had bad weather yesterday. Really bad for a while there. It looked horrible. And people were scurrying to get away. And I went to go take some two kids home that were blue and chattering. Went with another one to the store, and I sent her over to look at some toys. She wanted to get some toys, and I ran into Mimsy. And we blocked up the meat aisle for about 15, 20 minutes <laughs> as we talked, right? I think everything happens for a reason. I really do. Even the silly things, Don, I think they happen for a reason. I mean, I don't think God, but I would have never left there all day until that time. And I wouldn't usually go to Walmart. Not that I'm a snob, but I just, you I just usually don't go there. But I started thinking, you know what? Their produce is cheaper than any place else in town, in general. The other places smile at you more. Well, I smile more, too, by charging twice as much. But at any rate, uh, I'll do without the smiles for a while, okay? Anyway, and I was glad that we had that opportunity to talk because I've been thinking about her and I know she's going to be back tonight and giving us a word. And give an opportunity. It's archived at, at our Facebook page when she did her eulogy for her father. It's wonderful. I shared it before. Talked about uh, fishing and losing the flies and her dad deciding after all that calamity and talking throughout that day that he wasn't going to go any place again where he had to leave her someplace to go on, like to go on to cast and leave her on a rock over by wherever. He wasn't going to do that. And that wherever he took her, wherever he went, from that day far forward, they were inseparable, they were together all the time. Wherever he went would be someplace she could follow. And this is after 20 minutes. She, did, she has a wonderful sermon. I'm telling you, this is the end. My dad kept his promise. By all accounts, he's in heaven. He went to heaven. He lived his life so he could go to heaven and his daughter can follow him. Can't she? That's what he's asking us to do. Go on up.
step into the promise. Lay your children at my feet. You can't, you can't, you can't dent them. Lay them at my feet. And give what the locusts have eaten to God. You say, well, I've messed up, I've messed up, I've messed up so bad. I don't doubt that any of you messed up as bad as I did. Maybe, probably not much worse. Can we just take the scripture to be true? No matter how bad choices or poor choices we made, no matter what we said when we shouldn't have and what we didn't say when we should have, the woulda, coulda, shoulda is a life. You have them, I have them, we all have them. Can we just say, you know what? Like Pastor Don was saying one time when he was preaching, he says, for all these things we do this, the easy things. We do this. For everything else we have Jesus. So for all the things we can fix, the restitution we can make, yeah, we do that. We make it right, right? For everything else, we give to the God of Romans 8, 28. And let him work all things. The good, the bad, the ugly. All things. Not some things, all things together for good for those who are called, who love the Lord. That's us. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, I do thank you that history is not just history, particularly when it comes to Scripture. It's a lesson of people who were no better or no worse than us, just humans. People have lost their way, lost their divine image. I don't know if they ever lost it, but they were not able to see it in themselves, and thus they could not see it in others. They were blinded. And yet God was still there for them. He's encouraged us to have a part in the redemptive work of the gospel. To come alongside. To speak words of life to those that we come into contact with. And for those things that were less than lovely, harmful to place them under the blood and ask God to work them out also for good. And we're going to give you a praise as you continue to work in our midst. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.